Great. Um, I hope everyone had a, a great time watching the keynote um, and had a chance to get out there and get some refreshments, et cetera. Um, you're in the Mastering App Dynamics track. So if this is not the right track for you, this is an opportunity to, uh, to uh, find the right one. Um, I'd like to uh, introduce our speaker, Amod Gupta. You saw him on stage earlier. He's going to walk us through BIQ, what it is, um, show us some use cases about how it works. So please welcome Amod Gupta to the stage. Thanks, Kevin. Can you guys uh, hear me? Yes. OK. Um, welcome. Thanks for uh, attending this session. My name is Amod. I'm a product manager at AppDynamics. I've been with the company for uh, about four years now, just a little bit under. And I manage our uh, business IQ product, which means transaction analytics, log analytics, browser, end user, mobile, all that stuff. Before I begin, just a quick show of hands. How many of you are new to AppDynamics have not used it? OK. How many of you have used APM or end user but not used Business IQ? OK. And how many of you have used Business IQ in some shape or form before? OK. So we've got a good mix of all types. Great. Um, before we start, message from our sponsors at Legal. Um, you've seen this multiple times, nothing new. A lot of what I'm going to be showing you and talking to you, um, some of it may be in the future, some of it uh, may be PI, so just be aware of that. What I want to do over the next few minutes uh, is walk you through a few slides explaining what Business IQ is, how did we get to Business IQ, what's the platform behind the technology. Um, then I want to move on to two or three use cases from our partners in different industries. I'm going to show you a dashboard from a partner in the uh, travel industry, from a partner in financial services, and from a partner in the insurance industry. And uh, it's by no means going to be a very deep dive into how they use Business IQ, but it's just going to give you a glimpse of what those guys are doing. And then towards the end, I have a few slides on what's new in 4.3, which just got released, I think, a couple of weeks ago. Then towards the end of the section, we're going to do something funky. I'm going to move to that part of the room and run a demo from there, because um, for some uh, reasons, but let's not go into it. Uh, we'll do that, and we'll leave the last 10 minutes for Q&A. All right. So you've been hearing this all along. Every company is a software company. Digital transformation is well underway. What that means for people in this room is all the applications that you've been developing so far are the core of the business. IT is not backroom guy, uh, the a backroom office anymore. What it also means are is business has realized this. They're spending more and more money on uh, IT and, and digital transformation. Unfortunately, it also means that the cost of failure has increased a lot. Um, if your application is your core channel for user engagement, for revenue generation, any failure um, in that channel is, is unacceptable. This is, this is the thought behind coming up with Business IQ. AppDynamics is a nine-year-old company. We've been doing application performance monitoring. A few years ago, we realized that uh, this trend was well and truly underway. And then the right way to manage your applications now is with the lens of business. So you really want to see what, if you're looking at troubleshooting different issues that are impacting your applications, uh, you should start prioritizing those issues that impact your business more. Um, you should be capturing user behavior from your application in real time and let that tell you how their engagement with the business is going and start monitoring your applications and troubleshooting and diagnose those, diagnosing those issues with that lens. Our goal is to reduce mean time to business awareness. By that, we mean if your application is at the center of your business, which it is, and uh, you're monitoring it in real time, and you, those user engagement patterns change over time, you should know as soon as you can, and you should, you should be get alerted uh, about that and start changing those things. This is an example. I think David touched uh, on this example during the keynote. Suppose bad things happen in your application from time to time. Suppose there is a thread contention issue that led to the authentication service uh, not being available. And let's say that impacts your transfer for an application. You could use APM, our core technology, to start troubleshooting and diagnosing this issue. You can look at the snapshots. You can see when it's happening. You can get to the exact line of code and, and fix it. But what's more important is, with Business IQ, you can also start gaining insights about how many customers were impacted, 
what was the total amount of funds that was being transferred. Of those customers that were impacted, how many were platinum customers? These are the core of your business. How much money were those platinum customers transfer, uh, transferring during the time when this happened? You can get alerts about this in real time. Not just that there's a performance issue, but there's an issue with your business. There's an issue with the transfer funds application and this much revenue is at stake. On the left-hand side, you see all the different core technologies that go into, to, into powering this. Uh, we are looking at your databases, we are looking at your app codes, we are looking at every single line of code that's instrumented when customers are interacting with your application. And that's really feeding into business transaction, which provides us with the distributed context. So if someone clicks on uh, payment transfer and that transaction hits 50 or 100 different services and multiple infrastructure devices, multiple nodes, business transaction is the piece that really brings it together. Using that, we can start extracting metrics like the, the amount of funds transferred, the number of customers being impacted, and start showing you that in real time. It's built on this conceptual level architecture. It's built on top of our Signal IQ uh, platform. It stores both metrics and events. Uh, you can start sending log events. You can start sending transaction events. You can start sending end user events. You can also send custom events using the REST APIs. Business IQ gives you uh, advanced query language to then go and segment this data and derive insights from it. For those who are starting out with Business IQ, we also have a visual query builder, and I'll demo it to you in a while. So you don't have to, it, our language is very simple. It's SQL-like, so that it's easy for you to use. There's no steep learning curve. But there's also a visual query builder that allows you to drag and drop fields um, on different charts and widgets to start uh, visualization. Um, that's kind of the, the intro that I wanted to, to give to Business IQ. Um, next, in this section, I want to talk about some customers that are using Business IQ. Uh, none of this data that you're seeing is real production data. This is all um, either from their dev environments or uh, has been blurred and changed. But the graphs and the setup is, is real. So this is an airline's partner of ours who's using Business IQ to monitor different flights. They have multiple dashboards, and this is just one of them. Um, using Business IQ, they're looking at how many flights are getting delayed. Uh, what penalty do they owe to the Federal Aviation Authority when the delays happen? They are looking at different ports of origin, different sources of destination. They are looking at the currency that customers are using to book seats on this flight, um, whether it's USD, whether it's euros, or they're using miles, so on and so forth. There, again, this is one example of that. There are multiple dashboards like these, but this is just a glimpse um, into what kind of data they are extracting from Business IQ and uh, using it. This is an example from a financial services customer. This customer has a dual-sided network. They uh, work with clients and then service providers on the back end. And again, they use Business IQ to monitor the health of their dual-sided network. They look at um, all the service providers, the health of their service providers, the response time of the APIs that those service providers own. They also look at the traffic that they're sending to each service provider. They also look at the traffic they're getting from their clients so um, if XYZ company is a client of uh, this financial service customer, all the employees of the XYZ company use their services to make investment decisions. And they use Business IQ to focus on whether they're getting enough uh, requests from the client side, from the service provider side, are the response times, are the performances for those appropriate. They start using Business IQ to troubleshoot those issues as and when they uh, happen. Again, that was just one dashboard. Um, from uh, amongst many. This is a dashboard from one of our uh, insurance industry partners. They are undergoing digital transformation as we speak. So they used to have these applications which were monolithic, which were uh, um, not conducive to, to um, scaling well. And they, had, they depended a lot on the agents. What they're doing now is they've moved their online coding uh, policy, insurance policy coding application to to this web application. And what you see on the left-hand side is data from uh, one of their pre-prod or development environments. And you can see the beginnings of a funnel. They've set up a funnel like the one we showed you on stage, where a customer, when they come in and start requesting a policy code, go through different steps, they'll see at which step of the online policy code application are customers leaving, dropping off, where they're staying most, uh, what's the abandonment rate, what's the conversion rate. They're also looking at what is the amount 
that's being quoted by this application, how much of that amount actually gets converted into sales dollars. Uh, the way it works for them is once an uh, online quote is generated, one of their agents manually picks up that quote from uh, the online application and then reaches out to the customer who's, who, uh, who got that quote and then start converting those customers. In the process, those agents may upsell. Uh, if, if the customer asks for a vehicle insurance ghost, they may upsell house insurance, mortgage insurance, boat insurance, so on and so forth. So at the bottom right, you see values of upsell. And the funnel on the bottom, uh, on the right side, this two-step funnel, is really about the performance of the agents. What the company wants to do is, is, is look at uh, the online web application, how many quotes are generated, how many of those quotes that were generated are then picked up by agents, and how long did it take for the agents to pick them up, and then the performance of those agents as those quotes get converted. So those were some glimpses, some examples into how different customers uh, are using Business IQ today. In this section, I wanted to touch on a few um, features that were released in 4.3, which just went GA. One of the first things I want to talk about is query streaming. So we see our customers sending more and more and more and more data. We have billions of events hitting our um, SaaS environment every single day. What used to happen pre-4.3 was every query or every widget or every dashboard that hits the backend event service um, gets a synchronous request. So you see a spinny wheel on the UI if you're using Business IQ, and it takes five seconds for the data to come back. You'll see a spinny wheel. With 4.3, we have implemented streaming for our time series widgets. So what will happen now is if you're looking at a long period of time, let's say you wanted to see your revenue trend over the last 90 days, and you issue that query against a backend service, we'll start returning the data in chunks. And you'll start see, you'll, you'll see the most recent data first. So if you've got a line chart like this, you've got, you'll see the most recent data followed by another chunk, followed by another chunk. And if it's taking more time and you realize this is not the right format, you can cancel that and switch out. You don't have to wait for the full query to execute before seeing your results. Um, yeah. So this is a video. Um, I don't think I can play it with this clicker here, but I'll show you a, okay. So this is a streaming chart. Um, I'll come back to it in the demo, and what I wanted to show you here was different chunks that come, so you would see, if I pause the video at the right time, you could see the most recent chunk first, followed by two other chunks of those um, older times, followed by the entire time. The other thing that came out in 4.3 was enhancements to our business metrics. So pre-4.3, customers were uh, only able to create business metrics on count star queries. For example, you could count all the confirmed transactions that had an order value of greater than $100. But you couldn't create a metric on average order total. With 4.3, that we've removed that limitation. It was a silly limitation to begin with. <laughs> but we've removed that so you can use any of mathematical operators, any um, um, aggregate operators to create business metrics. We've also made the system more intelligent. So if you're upgrading your event service or if you're upgrading the uh, SaaS environments, it would not disable those metrics by default thinking that the query can't reach the event service. It now knows to distinguish between timeouts um, and uh, unavailability. And so when the event service or the environment comes back online, the metrics get enabled again and you would not miss any data. Lastly, this was just a small uh, UX limitation. We added the ability for the customers to view the queries after the creation of business metrics. This was missing, and we just needed to do that. Another thing that's uh, been the core theme of 4.3 is we wanted to make it easier for our customers to extract data. As first part of this, for transaction data set, we are introducing SQL data collectors. Before this, one of the most popular, and I'll show you a demo of this, one of the most popular ways to extract business data from your application is by instrumenting, uh, by using class method data collectors. What that lets you do is specify a class name and a method name, and then we can start collecting parameter values or return values. But you still need to know the class name and the method name. Oftentimes, that means reaching out to your developer partners or someone in the dev team to help you with the class and the method name. With SQL data collectors, uh, and it's, it's controlled by role-based access control, if you have the access, you can see those queries. Uh, for any prepared statement, like the one you're seeing here, you can collect the parameter values. You can do that in your transaction snapshots. 
we capture SQL statements in your transaction snapshot, so you can right click and say start collecting the user ID from here or the card ID from here. Or you can go into the data collection method and set up a uh, data collector. We will show you the list of all the databases in your environment. You can pick a database. We will show you all the SQL queries that we've seen uh, being executed against that database. You can pick one or more of those SQL queries, and then you can specify an index of the parameter you want to collect, and we'll start collecting that. And I'll walk you through a demo of that. You can type convert. So you can type convert from a string to an integer. We'll make a best case uh, effort to do that. And it's supported for both Java and .NET right off the bat. Next thing we did is, for those of you who use Node.js applications, um, before 4.3, all the data that was being sent by Node.js applications was of type string. Um, that was a big handicap. And you'd see this limitation removed in 4.3 for different data sets, and I'll walk you through that. But now, without doing anything, um, our new library knows the right data types from JavaScript and starts sending you the right data types in the platform. Same thing for end user data. If you're using a JavaScript agent to instrument um, or in adding add user data, if you're familiar with this API, if you're using the add user data API to send more data, it used to come in the string format. So if you're really sending a number, the visualization of that number as a string is a little wonky. Now we've added more APIs for you to add either long data, Boolean data, different date types, so on and so forth. Also, one other big limitation that's been removed in 4.3 is before your data collectors on the JavaScript page were global to the page. You would collect them once the, when the page loaded. If, you're ha if you have a virtual pages, um, if you have virtual pages in your application, now you can collect them per page, you can collect them per AJAX request, just gives you that finer level of granularity in, in data collection. Um, same thing for uh, our mobile applications. Both iOS and Android were limited to sending string data before. With 4.3, they can send different data types. We have more APIs for you to start populating with the right data types. And then the, one of the biggest pieces of investment that we made in 4.3 was in our um, log analytics module. We l heard your feedback loud and clear that setting up job files to collect logs was hard. You had to go to each machine. You had to come up with a grok pattern that was extremely hard to begin with. So what we've done is we've introduced this concept of source rules. Now there's a central place in the controller UI where you can configure all your log sources from. And I'll, again, demo this with you. You can walk through the configuration setup with a preview file. You can set up grok patterns to give us the structure of that log line. Then you can use automatic regex by just highlighting that log line, and we'll extract that, and we'll create a regex for you. You don't have to manually create the regex anymore. Um, we, you can extract different fields using that methodology. If it doesn't work, there's always the manual regex to fall back on. You can do type conversions. And then lastly, you can assign agent scopes. So once you've create, created a um, source rule for your log line, you can then assign that source rule to multiple agents from different applications, all from the controller UI, without touching the agent or the application machines ever. And we'll walk through a demo of that. And this is kind of the pipeline uh, that um, takes a look at that. So you set up your general configuration, which is timestamp format, path to the log file. Um, if you wanted to override the time zone, you can do that. Next, you specify field extraction using either grok patterns, if you've already set them up, or automatic regex, and I'll show you that, or manual regexes. Then you do field mapping. You can map that field to another one. You can mask values. You can uh, remove certain values. You can add static fields. You can convert type. Um, and then finally, you can assign agent scopes to these source rules, all from a centralized place. So you never have to um, touch the machines that have the log lines. And finally, the last thing I, I wanted to touch upon was it's a UX improvement. <laughs> Before 4.3, we had 50 shades of blue. Um, if you set up analytics widgets, it was always blue. There are, it's, not, it's, it's not gone the whole uh, um, hog yet. We have more things to do here, but we've introduced these color palettes in 4.3. So if you don't like those 50 shades of blue, you can choose from one of many color palettes and get a more um, visual dashboard. So um, this is an application that you saw um, 
an APM application. The first thing I wanted to show you was SQL data collectors. You can go into analytics, go into configuration. All these data collectors that you see here, like customer email, customer name, customer type, are coming from method invocation data collectors. So you can, this is, com this is being derived by setting a class name and a method name and extracting those values. Just below that, we've added a new category for SQL data collectors. These are coming from instrumenting your SQL applications, or sorry, your SQL queries that are hitting the databases, and by specifying those parameter indexes, um, like I mentioned before. Next, uh, you can use them the same way. So this is the visual drag and drop query builder that I was talking about. If you wanted to see your uh, segmentation of applications by loan type, you could just drag this here and you could see that segmentation by loan type. You could save this as a dashboard. You can start filtering on that by adding different criteria. So I only want to look at my AD Capital application. Of the AD Capital application, I am only interested in, let's say, loan amounts that are uh, greater than a certain type. And you can start filtering like that. You can also do this in a query language format. So you can start filtering your transactions by the same thing. So you can use the ADQL query language to filter it the same way you were doing in the visual query language. There are more operators that are available to you if you're using the query language. You can do more advanced segmentations, more advanced aggregations. But if you're just starting off with business IQ and for more, most of the widgets and uh, use cases, the, the visual builder suffices. If you wanted to create, this is the business metrics part, the fact that you can now create business metrics on more than just count star queries. For this filter, let's say I wanted to look at the average um, loan amount for my loan type. Sorry, loan type. Home. So by the way, when you click on the left-hand side, what we are showing you, because I've done a few times, what we're showing you is the top 10 values for that field in the last 15 minutes. So you can add them as a filter from here. You can add them as a filter by clicking on Add Criteria or by using the, the Where clause here. So now you're looking at all the transactions from the application AD Capital where loan amount is greater than 100,000 and your loan type is of type Home. Let's say I wanted to remove that and create a business metric on the average loan amount. I could do that. You can visualize it here. You can set up your metric here. Hit save. Amount already exists. You can good go there and uh, view the query that was that's associated with the metric that you've just created. You can view the metric in the metric browser, or you can add that to a dashboard or a widget. So loan amount I've just created, so I don't have any data behind it yet, but this is another metric that exists in the system for some while, so you can visualize this here, compare it, look at its min-max value, compare it against the baseline. All right, so this was the uh, setup screen for SQL Data Collector that I wanted to show you. You can go here add a SQL data collector, call it loan data collector. I'm not gonna create it because I've already created once. This is the only database in my application, but if you had more, you would see all of those here. You can pick that. We'll show you all the prepared statements and SQL queries that are hitting against this data database. So the one I'm interested in is this because I can see that I'm storing loan type, amount, customer ID, application status here. Select that, scroll down, um, add your first data collector, let's say, the first one I wanted was loan type. I can call it 
loan type one. I can specify a type. If it's coming in as a different type, we will try our best to type convert. I know my loan type is going to be a string, so I'll just choose that. Uh, the funny thing with the, with the libraries, JDBC libraries and ODBC libraries that do prepared statements is, by default, you start from parameter one instead of zero. So we, we start there. In this case, counting parameter index is just counting the, um, the question mark. So I know that loan amount is the second one. You can, the order of the question marks, even if it's a nested statement, it doesn't matter. You just start counting from left to right. And the value that you want to uh, cal um, sorry, capture is the index that you need. And that's, that's it. You then create the SQL data collector. You select the different transactions you want to collect that data from, add it, save it, and we'll start collecting it. That's how easy it is to set up. You don't have to go to a developer or some, some partner of yours in the development and ask them for the right class name or a method name. That's hard, which is what you would have to do if you were to grab that data using something like a method invocation data collector. Next, what I wanted to show you was uh, log configuration. So you'll see this tab is new in 4.3. You can go here and create a source rule. Let's go ahead and do that. Um, let's create a new source rule. We've got different templates, so if you're using a known log format, you can pick a template. If you've already created a source rule and you just wanted to tweak it a little bit and copy it, you can start from an existing source rule. I want to create a new one, so let's do that. Um, let's pick up a preview file. I will pick up this file. And this is the pipeline that I showed you on the slide. The first thing you do is just bookkeeping, give it a source name. Let's say I want to call it portal log, because I know this log file is coming from the portal tier. Source type is something to differentiate different events that are coming from your log file. Let's call it um, portal again. This is the location of the source file on disk. My source file is in Tomcat logs, and it's called loan application dot log. Um, so I'll just put that. If you wanted to provide the path of a directory and, and extract that as a field, you could do that. You can specify whether you want to collect from the beginning of the log file, end of the log file, or from the last whatever hours. You can override the time zone. You can pick your own time zone. You can override the timestamp format, change it. Um, if, you have, if you have duplicate timestamps, if there's thread contention, or for whatever reason, in your log file there are duplicate timestamps, AppDynamics will just add a counter, so we will order the events in which they were received, just if you wanted to see the order. And uh, we can collect gzip files also. Next is, uh, this, is your, this is the preview of your log file. So you can see there are various ways of extracting fields. We recommend, you can use whichever one you like, we recommend that you use the grok pattern to specify the structure of the log line. So for example, this is the timestamp, this is the severity level, info, et cetera, this is uh, the thread ID, this is the timestamp in the log line, this is the name of the class, um, and then the message. I just want to specify that structure using grok pattern. And instead of coming up with a grok pattern here, I have something that's that I've copied from before. I'm going to go in and paste it here. You can hit refresh. And this preview will show you whether your grok pattern worked. If there are any errors or if it wasn't the right one, you will see it right here. So you can see that I specified the structure using the grok pattern. I specified the class name. Um, it, it's already getting extracted. This is the data part. This is the log level, timestamp, so on and so forth. And you can see this for different, different types of log lines. Next, let me show you the auto uh, field extraction. Next up, what I want to do is I want to extract the username from those log lines that have them. Let's pick this log line as a definer sample. And definer sample just means your main log line uh, that's representative of the data that you want to extract. I'm going to highlight this part. This is my username. Uh, it 
automatically detects that, okay, maybe the colon, the string before the colon is what you want to call it, but you can change it. So uh, let's say I want to call it username. My field type is string. This is a sample value. Hit extract. And we've created a regex for you, and you can see whether it's matching all of your lines or not. This is the regex if you were interested in seeing that. Now I can see it matches this line, this line, but it doesn't match this line. Um, so let's add that as a refiner sample. I want to refine my field extraction regular expression. I want to store that in the same name. Hit extract, and that's it. You can now see more lines are matching. You can go to non-matching lines. I want to extract it from this line also, but it's not picking it up automatically, so let's add that as a refiner sample. Highlight that guy. Same field, username, hit extract, and now more and more lines are matching. So you can do this iteratively and uh, keep refining your source rule. And we'll keep refining the regex that's generated for you um, here. For some reason, if you're unable to do that using the auto regex, uh, for example, or you already have a manual regex that's been working well for you in the past, you can just copy paste that here. It's the same, same thing. Next in the pipeline, once you've extracted this, you can do field management. Oh, by the way, you can uh, um, extract multiple fields from the same log line. So now if I wanted to extract just the last name, not the fully qualified last name, I could say class, again, type string, hit extract, and you'll see us matching more and more of these fields. So it, our attempt here is just to make the lives easier for our users. You don't have to spend a lot of time in grok patterns or coming up with manual regexes. You can do this, this automatically here. Um, next up is field management. So for the fields that you selected or extracted using grok patterns or manual or um, automatic regex, you'll see all of them here. I have my username. If I wanted to mask the value of that username, I could do that and specify the character that I wanted to mask the value from. So if you have a, you don't want to see the first name and you know that the first five or some characters are going to be first name, you can do that. Specify the character that you want to mask it with. You can do uh, other things like add static fields to your log events. Um, for the fields that you're extracting, you can replace the values, you can rename the fields, change the field type, remove it. You can do a bunch of uh, bookkeeping operations. And then finally, you go to agent mapping. So agent mapping is, now that you've created a source rule for a sample log file, and you want to send this configuration to all of your log agents, you can create a scope for them and, and send them one or many um, configs. These are all of my log agents that are reporting into my controller right now. Let's say I wanted to pick uh, the portal one. I can add it. I can add more. Call it uh, temp agent scope. Save it. Assign it to the temp agent scope, the source config I just created. Hit save. And then we haven't sent anything right now. You can save your config even if it's half-baked. Once you're sure you are ready and everything's set, you can come back and enable it, at which point we will send this configuration down to all the log agents that are masked as part of that scope. And they'll get this configuration. It'll be stored locally, and you'll start seeing all your fields. By default, uh, the log agent checks for any source configs every five minutes. But you can change that in the config properties if you want it to be more frequent or less frequent or whatever else. Um, this will work with 4.3 agents, 4.3 controller, and 4.3 event service. So uh, if you wanted to use this feature, you'd have to uh, upgrade. And lastly, uh, Kevin, how are we doing on time? Okay. You can go into my preferences here. 
choose from the different color palettes. Um, let's say if you chose this, save it. If you go back to your dashboards, this is the one I think I demoed on Keynote. This doesn't have anything that's that colorful. But you can see a conversion funnel that's coming up with different colors. So you know, if you're more of a visual person who's bothered by something like this, you can go ahead and do that. Uh, just I'm referring to the last dashboard, the one where, where you were showing about business performance and application performance. What does business performance actually mean? Could it be something like you can take anything, for example, end user page, for example, and you can map that one to the APM side, that kind of thing you're trying to show that there? Yeah, it means different things for different people. What we wanted to um, mean by that is there is a DevOps team and there's an application team. Someone in the application team is the app owner, line of business owner. There are some KPIs that are important for them to gauge um, how they're doing. For example, if I own Business IQ, one of the most important things for me is how much data is my, are my customers sending into SaaS every day? Which are my top 10 customers that are executing most number of queries? Those are the kind of KPIs I need to know that are to, know, to understand that my SaaS platform is healthy. I also want to do, because we use EC2, I also want to do cost margin analysis against the data that's coming to us and the license price we charge against those customers. I can look at the data that a customer is sending. So company app B is sending me, um, let's say, 500 gigs of log data and 30 million transaction events every single day. But the license um, price for that is whatever. And I can calculate those cost margins. Basically, any KPI that's important for your business and it'll be different for different businesses, you can start monitoring with that. What you touched upon with page performance um, and uh, uh, transaction performance, that correlation, that's also possible. So you can, the ADQL queries I used were to filter transaction data. You could use them to filter your end user data and segment the page performance by different customers or different products or different URLs, uh, if that's what's important for you. What basically that dashboard was trying to show me, is it, is it like, is there any, any kind of use case which you can suggest? For example, like when I try to look into the APM side, I see certainly there are some business transactions there. Correct. And you were correlating that one to, to some other business performance. Correct. And my understanding with my with App Dynamics or APM experience, I just feel that maybe some kind of correlation you can do from end user monitoring yeah. perspective. Yeah. Or is it something like information point can kind of thing also you can bring from APM perspective to the business IQ exactly. and map it? Exactly. So APM um, looks at every single transaction that's coming into your system, aggregates the performance of that, and sends that data to the controller once every minute, which is then stored as a metric. So if you have a login page or a login transaction, and there are 100 login requests in the last one minute, Every minute, we will send you 100 calls per minute for login business transaction. The response time for those hundreds as one values, the average, and number of errors that we saw. But if you wanted to see of those 100, how many of those people were from, uh, take any example, Barclays, uh, or how many of them were from North America, you could then use Business IQ to segment that because we will store every single request in the Signal IQ platform. Tell me if the, um, is the log analytics, is that licensed separately from the other products? Yeah, it's got a log, there's a separate license for log analytics. Right. And say, for example, I had a, uh, an application log that was generating, <coughs> I don't know, 20,000 error alerts. Does, does it work with the baseline component to say, okay, I'm not going to generate 20,000 alerts for you. I'm going to say, okay, I've noticed that the volume has dropped. a lot more errors occurring. Yeah. So uh, it's not something that will happen out of the box for log analytics. There are two things here. When you set up your APM, first of all, if your application is logging messages with the severity level error, you can turn on an error detection module by checking just one box in your APM that will start marking those business transactions as error if any part of that distributed application code was logging any message with severity level error. And you'll start getting alerts and baselines for those. If you're using log analytics, and for some reason, let's say you're not using APM at all, and all you have is log analytics, by default, we will start collecting all those events. The way I showed you, you can extract that field called severity as error, 
you then have to manually create a metric on it, count of error messages seen per minute, and it'll get automatically baseline and you'll start getting alerts. But the act of setting up that metric would be manual. Okay, that's great, thank you. Yep. Uh, the, at what levels is the information locked? Is this method calls or could that also be something like mouse movements or th something? I'm sorry, like can that? you repeat that? Um, at what level do you, can you, can you uh, lock data? Is this, for example, method calls or, I mean, I haven't seen how do you specify that or could it also be a mouse movement, movement of mouse on the screen? Yeah, it's, it's different levels for different types. If you have a backend application, let's say if you had a Java application, um, we can start instrumenting at a method, at a line of code. So yeah, method for certain, but if you wanted to, uh, to instrument one line of code inside that method, you could do that. You could method, you can certainly capture parameters and return values from the methods. If you're doing it on a JavaScript application, the lowest level of granularity that's available to you is virtual pages, AJAX requests, those kind of things. Um, in your JavaScript application, we don't track mouse movements yet, um, but if, you're if any click, any button click is leading to an AJAX request, you can call that. In the mobile applications, um, when you have your mobile controllers and your activity screens, we can start logging at the level of each of those activity screens. So it, it varies from where your data source. Is it here? Yeah. I like the logs, I like the dashboards and so on, but I'm more interested into having automatic alerts. So my system currently needs a 24 by seven monitoring. I don't want to put people to do that one, even though I high this team doing this. We are in the digitalization, so I want 24 by seven alert nonstop. Currently, what we have in AppDynamics sends an alert after one hour. My systems are in production needs instant alert because even 15 minutes on a Sunday when I'm working with Japan, it's critical for us. Hmm. How is this one plan? Is it in the new version? So um, you can set up alerts Okay, the way the system works is you set up a health rule and then you set up alerts on those health rules. By default, the time period that those health rules look at is last 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. you, can, hour. you can set it up to as low as one minute and as much as last six hours. But by default, the health rules that, so for example, if you were alerting on the number of orders, if I set up a health rule by default and don't change any parameters, it's going to look at the number of orders in the last 30 minutes and if any data point in the last 30 minutes deviates by two standard deviations from the baseline, as an example, we will send you an alert then. So th the health rule deviation is checked once every minute. The data that we are looking at by default is the last 30 minutes, but that's configurable already. So if your alerts are not firing at the frequency um, that you expect them to be and you want them to be more real time, you can go up to as much as one minute. Okay, we have the health rule created and we are not allowed to put timestamp more than one hour. So okay. we get alert only every one hour. We wrote already a ticket to the support team okay. since one month. Okay. We didn't get any result. <laughs> okay. And for us it's really critical because as I said, we have live data in production in markets like Japan. And um, uh, which company are you? Uh, Daimler AG. Okay, <laughs> I'll take an, make a mental note of that. Thank you. Hi, so one of the questions I've got is, we use Adobe Analytics, yeah. currently. how does this compare against that? Because you know, again, looking Thank at Thank you for uh, asking that question. It comes up again and again. Um, Adobe Analytics, there's certainly a little bit of overlap between Adobe Analytics and uh, what we're doing with AppDynamics. The reason why those tools exist are different though. Adobe Analytics, and Adobe is one of our partners, a lot of our exec staff is from Adobe. Um, is really a, a tool that aim, is aimed at marketers. And what it's really good at is looking at historical data to generate reports. So Omniture is what it was called before, before it became Adobe Omni Analytics. It sends you very detailed reports every week. 
or every month. If that's the um, timeliness that you're okay with, then it's, it's a great tool to use for marketing, for tracking your campaigns and seeing your, how your campaigns are affected. If you want to get real-time data, then you have to come into analytics. There are things like funnel that you can do both over historical data and real-time data. Where AppDynamics excels is when your user is clicking on the application now, we will have that event in the system in less than a minute, and you will start to see the funnel populated with that in a minute. The dashboards can refresh as fast as a minute. So the basic difference is in the real-time nature versus the reporting uh, aspect of it. Also, we don't do things like campaign tracking and all of that. We are solely focused on the application, its performance, and how it impacts your business rather than solving that. Does that answer your question? Yeah. In fact, uh, there are a few customers in UK that I met um, who use both. And when we were doing the POV for Business IQ with them, they called in the, the digital uh, person in their company to come and sit in the room who owned Omniture because something like that came up. And he said, things like snapshots, thing like, things like uh, browser snapshots that show me the resource timing on every page in real time is something that's not available to them via uh, Adobe Analytics or Omniture. So that was a great tool for them. We have one more time for one more question. Okay. Great. I've got a sort of two-part question. Around the, the log analytics, is that a separate agent that gets installed on the server to collect the logs as well as the APM data? Um, it's, this, it's part of the same machine agent. Okay. So there's an app agent for Java, and there's a machine agent that's looking at infra monitor, um, infrastructure monitoring. The analytics agent is a part of the machine agent. You can just turn it on and log and transactions are both in the same machine agent. So it's not a separate agent. There's also a separate binary if you, for some reason, don't want to install the uh, machine agent. For example, if you're working in a Azure-type environment where you're not so concerned about the machines per se, but you only want to get the log lines, you have a separate binary that's available to you. But by default, it's part of the machine agent. And, and secondly, are you seeing the um, log analytics as a direct competitor to Splunk or Elk? Because I do remember seeing at a Splunk conference maybe two or three years ago that App Dynamics had an integration with Splunk where you could kind of drill into the Splunk dashboards. Yeah. Whereas kind of what you showed seems to be, you know, a direct It is. It is. Um we're trying to do exactly the same thing when it comes to basic log management as Splunk. Uh Splunk for sure is much more advanced with use cases like security and some of what they call their premium apps. We our aim is to give you more infrastructure data to diagnose your application performance or business performance issues. And for that, we need uh, log data sometimes that has valuable information in it. So this is a way to look at, I mean, any log use case that you need for doing performance troubleshooting or business monitoring troubleshooting will be done by this log analytics tool just as good as with Splunk. The integration with Splunk still exists. So it's not like we are saying you can only use our product, you cannot use Splunk. If you have Splunk and you want to use transaction analytics or APM with Splunk, you can go from the snapshots to the log lines in Splunk. But there's a difference. Um, if you have a transaction snapshot and you, there was an error and you wanted to get more details from the log file and you were using Splunk, we could take you from the snapshot to Splunk and narrow it down to the time range and the host name and show you log lines from there. But with our own agent, because it understands how app agent works, we can go one level deeper. So every single transaction event has a unique good. If you're logging into an, a website, that chain of requests has a unique good. In different machines and different services are logging uh, messages as part of that one login transaction. You can turn on our log analytics. We will start logging the unique request good for that. And so if you're looking at snapshot in APM and you want to go to the log messages that are relevant in AppDynamics, we won't narrow it down by time range and machine. We will show you the exact single message that was logged by every single machine when this transaction was executed. So we, by the virtue of knowing more how APM works, we have that uh, ability to do that, whereas with Splunk, you get the time-based correlation, and then you have to sift through the log lines to find the relevant one. Thank you. Great. Last one, yeah. OK. One more. Because she has the mic, yeah? Yeah. Right. 
and I guess he's already uh, asked you. Okay. So that's regarding Splunk and AppDynamics, yeah. really. So you said Log Analytics needs a separate license, yes. right? So if we, as a client, don't choose to go for Log Analytics, mm -hmm. and we do have Splunk and AppDynamics, mm -hmm. is it still possible to achieve the same level of integration as you were suggesting with Log Analytics over here? Yeah. Yeah. So um, there is a plugin in AppDynamics um, Community Store, I think it's called. And it's free. It's the Splunk plugin. You can go into the controller and enable it. Right. You can point it to your Splunk instance, um, provide the auth and all that, and then you will start linking your log yep. messages in Splunk with your APM data mm -hmm. or transaction analytics data. But the difference is, because Splunk doesn't know how AppDynamics internals work, we are right. limited to, if you're troubleshooting a snapshot, if you're limited to narrowing down the number of log messages by time or by host, and you still need to find the exact line, uh, log line that, in, that correlates with that APM snapshot. Okay. If you have AppDynamics log analytics, we know what log go it is, what's the unique identifier for each login. We can extract that automatically and show you the exact log messages that were generated by one single transaction. So you can use both. Um, if you already have Splunk, you can continue to Just use that. Them. If we need to make a decision, do we need really need to go for log analytics because it's a separate license? Can we safely choose not to? That was my question, really. Or yeah. is there something that is a, a critical advantage that we might just lose because of not choosing it? Um, you know, it's a, it's a sales question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> If there's any salesperson in the room, I don't want them to hate me and come back to me. I'm That's OK. <laughs> so uh, I'll leave it for them. Um, but you would get different functionality, and this would be the primary difference okay. if you choose one versus the other. Thank you. Just another question. Yeah. Um, the uh, SQL parameters, the mm -hmm. data collectors. So if we're using that, is there an overhead, and what level of overhead would that be? So. We are not looking at, we are not collecting SQL parameters from your databases. Okay. We are collecting SQL parameters from your application code. So we are instrumenting the libraries that are making those JDBC or uh, ADO.NET calls. And we are getting that from there. Even if you just have APM, we are looking at every single method. Mm. So if you turn on SQL collectors, it's not like we are instrumenting more of your application source code or we are looking at more log lines. Okay. All the data we just threw away previously, instead of throwing away, we would just send it to the event service and start storing. Okay. Having said that, when you turn it on, mm. the first request after it's turned on is uh, that has an overhead because the instrumentation will take place and b the bytecode instrumentation will take place. But okay. once that's happened, uh, um, any subsequent request is just steady state. Yeah, the reason I asked is because if there are critical transactions and on that flow, along the critical transactions. I wouldn't want to add, add data collector if it is introducing even an initial overhead, right? Yeah, is so that something? Yeah. makes sense. And the overhead from any instrumentation technology comes from walking the heap to get the call stack. Right. Picking up method parameter values and return values is not okay. any relevant overhead. And in analytics, we don't collect snapshots. Mm -hmm. Any snapshot that APM collects, we just show you in that tool also, and we let you segment that using the query language. We don't walk the heap more than the APM tool does. And you can tune those parameters to say, once every 10 minutes, collect a snapshot, or once every 100 requests, collect a snapshot. But we aren't doing any more instrumentation to your application than uh, APM. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Yeah, I think that's all we can have uh, take for, for the session. Um, round of applause for Ramon, Thank please. you. Um, if, if everyone could please uh, exit um, that doorway, uh, because we want to avoid a, a bottleneck here in the expo floor. We have lunch, uh, I think, right now, available for everybody outside. So um, thank you so much for attending the BIQ session. There will be more sessions uh, in here if you want to learn more about AppDynamics and become a master. Thank you. <laughs>